The objective of this video is to identify the salient properties of semiconductor switches and outline the selection process for power converters. We are also going to review the semiconductor realization of the single pole double throw switch that we introduced in a previous lecture. So the salient properties of semiconductor devices can be categorized as the following. One, the voltage and current rating. Two, the on state behavior three, the transient properties, and four, the thermal properties of the device. Let's go through this one by one. The voltage and current rating. This specifically refers to the device's ability to block voltage. And if this is a MOSFET, this refers to your VDS max, or breakdown, your maximum drain to source voltage. If this is a diode, this refers to your maximum reverse voltage. Secondly, this, this refers to the current rating of the device and whether that is an average current rating, an RMS rating, or a peak rating, or some combination of these three values. So again, this refers to the conducted current, which would be the drain current if it's a MOSFET, or the forward current if it's a diode. Next, the on-state behavior of the device. This refers to the resistance for a MOSFET, the channel resistance, or RDS on. We refer to this as RDS on because it describes the resistance that appears between the drain and the source of the MOSFET when the MOSFET is completely turned on. That is, when its gate to source voltage is far beyond the threshold voltage and the MOSFET is operating in the ohmic region. For a diode, we talk about the forward voltage drop, which we have been calling VD. Next, the transient properties of the devices. This refers to the amount of time it takes a MOSFET to turn on or off, which is listed in data sheets as TR and TF. And it also refers to the amount of delay time between when you start to turn your gate on and when the device actually starts to transition, or when, from when you start to turn your, your gate off and the device actually starts to transition. So this is both the turn on and turn off time and the turn on and turn off delay time. And both of these are for a MOSFET. For a diode, we talk about reverse recovery charge. In fact, we, we describe this in terms of a charge, a current, and a, re and a reverse recovery time. And we'll be talking about that more in a subsequent video. Finally, the thermal properties. This refers to the, no, the amount of temperature rise you see in your device based on the amount of power that's dissipated in the device, so a degree Celsius per watt. And as electrical engineers, we like to model this as an effective thermal resistance, subscript theta, and uh, xy, where x is the temperature rise from surface x to surface y. So this is heat rise. And we'll be talking about that later in today's video. But now I want to go back and I want to review our semiconductor realization of the single pole double throw switch and show how we can derive from that the required voltage and current rating of our devices. So suppose that we have a 48 volt battery which is our source. And from that, we want to get 12 volts for a load. And this is called a buck converter, when we're bucking our voltage down to some output, so to a lower output voltage. So I've drawn a semiconductor realization here, and I want you to think for a second about if this is a viable converter. Will this work? So think about it for a second, uh, pause the video, and press play when you're ready to resume. 
So this will in fact not work and hopefully you've identified a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that we have no current stiffener. We've got no current source here. So let's add an inductor. And now what I want you to do is I want you to draw an arrow indicating the direction of the pole current or the load current. So draw an arrow indicating the current path of the load current or the pole current. And then label the voltage polarity across the load. Put a plus and a minus across your load resistor to indicate how your voltage appears. Press pause now and resume when you are ready. All right, so we are delivering power from our source to our load, which means that our load current has to take this path. And if our load current takes this path, clearly our voltage polarity must be like this, plus and minus. And you can also see this just from the principles of the power pole. We can't possibly produce a negative voltage across this resistor because all we can do is reduce down our load voltage as seen on the other side of our power pole. So this brings us to the next problem with this implementation, which is that we can see that our pole current, which we can label here as IP, is actually negative, and our throw voltage is positive. If you go back and review the quadrants that we sketched in our previous lecture on the semiconductor realizations based on pole current sign and throw voltage sign, you'll see that the semiconductors that we've drawn here are for a positive pole current and a positive throw voltage, but in this case we actually have a negative pole voltage or a negative pole current. So this will not work. Let's go back and change this to what it should be for a negative pole current and positive throw voltage. So we should have a diode on the top and a MOSFET in the bottom, and the arrows should match the direction of the pole current that the pole current has to take when, when each device is conducting. So when each device is conducting, we can draw the following equivalent circuit models. So model one is when the top device is conducting. And we can sketch our model as a single pole double throw switch where the pole is connected to the top throw. And we'll draw our load as a current source equal to the load current. When the, when the pole is connected to the bottom throw, we get the following model. So one of these two states is always true. Either our pole is connected to the top throw or our pole is connected to the bottom throw. Now let's put some numbers to this problem. Let's assume that we have an efficiency of 100%. In a realistic power converter, you will of course have some losses. But if your converter is any good, it will have at least 90% efficiency and may very well be quite close to 100% efficient. And let's now say that we have we want to deliver 48 watts to the load. Since we have 100% efficiency, this means that we have 48 watts of input power. And we know that just from the power balance equation, or the principle of energy conservation. Input power has to equal output power plus losses, and in this case we have no losses. So we can use this then to determine the average currents at all points in our circuit. So let's sketch some currents on here. Let's label our input current as IS, the average input current. I'm using capital letters to denote the average values. We've already labeled our average output current as IL and assumed it to be DC. And we can label our throw current for each of the throws. And we can say then that our average input current has got to be equal to our input power divided by our input voltage, which gives us one amp. Similarly, our output current has got to be equal to our output power divided by our output voltage, which gives us four amps. 
We're now in a position to determine the average current through each of the throws. And the throw current corresponds to our device current. The average current through throw one is the average current through our diode. The average current through throw two is the average current through our MOSFET. And we do this using Kirchhoff's current law. So the average current through throw one has got to be equal to our average source current minus our average load current just by doing KCL at this node. Similarly, our average throw current to the second throw has got to be equal to the negative of our average throw current in the first throw plus the load current. So this is a super node. We can see that we sum up all the currents entering this node. IT1 plus IT2 plus IL has got to equal zero. Therefore, IT2 is equal to the negative of IT1 plus IL. So let's convert this information now to the device ratings, the voltage and current ratings that we require. Let's start with voltages. That's the simplest. So the blocking voltage for each device. The diode, or the top throw, you can see that when the diode is off and the MOSFET is conducting, we have the entire throw voltage appearing across the diode. So when the, when the, di when the MOSFET is conducting, it's effectively a short circuit here and we therefore have 0 volts across the MOSFET but 48 volts across the diode. Similarly for the MOSFET, when the diode is, in, is conducting it appears like a short circuit and the MOSFET has to block the entire throw voltage which is 48 volts. So we now know that each of the devices must have to withstand 48 volts. When it comes to picking out a semiconductor, though, you wouldn't want to go with this value. Parasitic leakage and, and capacitances in your circuit are going to result in there being instantaneous surges in voltage during transient events. So a good rule of thumb is to rate your is to pick your components to have a rating of one and a half to two times more than your circuit uh, specifies, more than your throw voltage. So we determined our blocking voltage requirements directly from the throw voltage. Let's now talk about the current requirements. Well, the average diode current is equal to our throw current, the throw one current. And our peak diode current we can look at model 1 and we can see that our peak diode current is actually going to be equal to IL. So the diode is either carrying IL or it's carrying no current. Similarly, our MOSFET is going to have the same average value as IT2. Well, the peak MOSFET current is again going to be equal to IL. And you can see this by considering model 2. In model 2, when the throw is connected to the bottom pole, the MOSFET must carry the entire load current. It's also either zero or at the load current. So I want you to notice here, while, while the blocking voltage was fairly simple to obtain, we just looked at the throw voltage, the current requirement, we had to invoke two properties. One, we had to use uh, our, our power balance equation. to solve our circuit. And two, we had to use KCL, Kirchhoff's current law. So both, both principles together we used to solve our circuit, and then we were able to determine what the peak and the average values are for our device currents. And if you remember, at the beginning of the video, I said that your current rating can also be specified in terms of the RMS value that's required. So let's consider that. Let's sketch the waveform for the current in our MOSFET. Or rather, let's sketch the waveform of the current in throw 2. And as we talked about previously, we can define two intervals. One interval where the first throw is on, and a second interval where the second throw is on. 
And so when throw 1 is on, IT2 is 0. When throw 2 is on, when throw 2 is on, IT2 is equal to our pole current, which is the negative of the load current. And we talked previously about how we can relate this to how we can relate the average value of this to our load current by defining a duty ratio. And the duty ratio was the fraction of time that our throw is on as compared to the entire period of the throw. So d2 is equal to t2 on over t1 on plus t2 on, or it's equal to t2 on over our switching period. So let's now calculate the RMS value of this waveform. And the definition of RMS, root, square root of the mean of the square of our throw current. And this expression simplifies down to being the square root of the throw times our load current. And we can calculate this. So we, we can determine our duty ratio, d2, from this first equation that we expressed it as. So d2, d2 is equal to it2 divided by ip, which is equal to negative 1 over negative 4 equals 0 0.25. And therefore, our MOSFET RMS value. So we find 2 amps RMS for our MOSFET rating. And notice that this is different from the average value of the current that flowed through our MOSFET. The average value was 1 amp. So next, I'd like to step you through a data sheet for an actual part and point out the salient properties within this data sheet. So this is a data sheet for a MOSFET, for a power MOSFET from Fairchild. Fairchild has been acquired by On Semiconductor. So you can pull this up. Uh, you can go directly to the to the device manufacturer's website to find to find a data sheet for a device, or you can go to your part vendor, for example, DigiKey or Mauser, they will have the data sheets linked to the parts within their website. And in this case, we're looking at at the Fairchild uh, 60 a 60 volt part with a rated current of 21 amps. And let's just step through this data sheet part by part and point out the key details. So at the beginning, the data sheets all summarize in bullets the key features of their design. And for us, the information that matters is this first bullet where we indicate RDS on as being 20 milliohms uh, for a certain gate source voltage and a certain drain current. Here again, RDS on is given, but now we have a lower gate source voltage. So 20 milliohms. This is the this is the value of resistance that you see between your drain and source of the MOSFET when your device is all the way on. It also talks about having a low gate charge. This is important for turning your device on and off rapidly. Um, and various other points. Uh, the next thing to point out is a particular package of this device. So when you pick out a MOSFET, oftentimes you're constrained by the package that you can work with in your design. The TO220 package is a through-hole package, and you can see that on the back here is where you can mount a heat sink. So there's actually a hole right here that you can put a, a bolt through to mount a heat sink on. <clears throat> and each of the pins is labeled. Here's our gate, here's our drain, and our source and connected to the, to the electrical symbol, the schematic symbol. <clears throat> and you can see that this MOSFET has a diode built into it. That is a fundamental property of MOSFETs. Every time that you construct a MOSFET, you, uh, you get a diode along free for the ride. So that means that you can block voltage this way, but you cannot block voltage the other way because your diode will turn on. So going, moving on to the maximum ratings, we have a maximum drain-to-source voltage rating of 60 volts. 
So this is the maximum blocking voltage between the drain and the source. In the example that we've been talking about, we determined that we, we required a 48 volt throw. So would this design, would this MOSFET work for our design? And the answer is maybe. It falls outside of that rule of thumb of picking a part that's rated for 1.5 to 2 times the throw voltage. Um, 60 volts is a little bit under 1.5 times 48, but possibly it, it could work. It also specifies the maximum and minimum gate to source voltage. Now these are the absolute maximum ratings that you cannot exceed or you may experience failure. Typically gate to source voltage levels that a, that a uh, MOSFET gate driver will issue are between 0 and 10 volts. We're going to talk about gate drivers more later, but you need a dedicated circuit to operate your gate of your MOSFET. Next we specify the maximum continuous drain current, but notice that this is for a temperature of 25 degrees. TC means the temperature of the case. When the case temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, you can flow 21 amps DC of current and your part will be okay. If you increase the temperature, now you're down at 15 amps of current. And if you just pulse your current, you can get up to, to 84 amps of instantaneous current. Moving on here, we talk about the maximum and minimum temperature that the device can be operated at, stored at. So this device works from negative 55 degrees Celsius all the way up to 175 degrees Celsius. And then the thermal characteristics. So this is one of the, one of the categories of salient details of a part. And as promised, you can see that this is specified as an R theta value. So the first R theta value is the thermal resistance between the junction and the case of the part. What does that mean? Well, the junction refers to the PN junction, the actual semiconductor, and the case is the enclosure of the part that you could mount a heat sink onto. So this tells you how many degrees Celsius your PN junction is going to increase for a watt of power relative to the case temperature. Also given is the thermal resistance of going from the PN junction to ambient. A stands for ambient. Ambient means that you don't have a heat sink on this. You're just relying on the case to disperse the heat to the, to the ambient conditions. And so this is a much higher thermal impedance. That means that you're going to have a 62.5 degree Celsius heat rise in your junction compared to ambient for every watt of power that you dissipate. So we never use this. We always put a heat sink on our parts because this value is so large. We want to we want to work with this value. And we'll talk about this in more detail later. Moving on, we have the electrical characteristics again summarizing our breakdown voltage and our gate source threshold, our our channel resistance. And now for some more interesting details. So this gets into the transient capabilities. And here we've summarized information regarding the total charge that's required on our MOSFET gate to turn it on and off. This, this determines how quickly your MOSFET can be turned on and off. To turn a MOSFET on, you have to charge up the gate to obtain a, a, a certain gate source voltage on it. And the ability of your MOSFET driver to deliver that charge rapidly determines how quickly your MOSFET can turn on. And in this data sheet, we have specified a rise time and a fall time, or a turn on time and a turn off time, under certain given conditions. And the delay time between when the MOSFET will turn on and off under those same conditions. So you can see that this part can turn on in about 34 nanoseconds and turn off in about 8 nanoseconds. So we've, we've been talking about the switching time of our devices as being a switch, or uh, the switching frequency of our devices as being a, a fixed frequency. So we've been talking about duty ratios as being the device on time over the uh, switching period. And, and we haven't spent much time talking about the selection of the switching period, but here you're starting to see the first constraint on how you select that switching period. Say that you want to operate a device at one megahertz. So you want to operate your single pole double throw at one megahertz. Can this device work for that? Well, we can see that to turn on and off our device, we're burning up about 42 nanoseconds, and one megahertz corresponds to a switching period of one microsecond. So yeah, it, it probably could. But what about 10 megahertz? 
Well, now our, on and on, now our switching period corresponds to 100 nanoseconds, which is awfully close to the amount of time we're spending just turning on and off our switch, which is probably not a very suitable configuration. The next section here talks about that body diode. So if you, if you are relying on that body diode, uh, you need to pay attention to this section. And it specifies the rated current through the diode, uh, a, a maximum pulsed current. And then, interestingly, uh, this reverse recovery information. So we had talked about this at the beginning of the lecture as being a reverse recovery time and a reverse recovery charge, which we'll describe more in a, in a later video. Okay, so all the information so far has been in table form, but what is more interesting and more useful is to look at this in graphical form. So the manufacturer will test these devices over a range of conditions and show you how all these parameters vary as you vary these conditions. This first graph here is a zoomed in version of our IV characteristics. So that is a zoomed in version of this plot. We're graphing VDS against our drain current. And over here, this region is our ohmic region when our device is all the way on. And this region in here is our, is our active region, which we try to avoid. And then down here is when the device is off. So they've zoomed into this, and they're showing you how um, the drain current will value based on how you've selected your gate source voltage. The plot on the right here, we don't have to worry about. This is for if you're operating the device within this active region. It's a transfer characteristics. Next, we can see how RDS on will vary with drain current and for different gate source voltages. So the data sheet lists a, a rated RDS on, but you can see that actually, depending on the circumstances that you're operating your device at, you can have a wide range of values, um, perhaps around 17 milliohms, all the way up to, I don't know, about 37 milliohms, so quite a range. On the right side, we're showing the characteristic of the body diode. So this allows you to determine the exact forward voltage drop across the diode as a function of the current through the diode and the temperature of the diode. So if we have 10 amps flowing through this, and we're at 25 degrees Celsius, so room temperature, you can see that we have about, I don't know, 0.75 volts of, of drop. But this increases all the way to, you know, maybe one and a quarter volts if we are far beyond our, our device ratings. Moving on, the next interesting thing is, is these normalized plots. So on the left side um, is graphed the value of breakdown voltage as a function of the junction temperature. So you can see that if we are operating in really cold conditions, we, can act, we actually have to derate our part. Our junction will break down at a lower value of voltage. And these are normalized values, so 0.9 means that that's 0.9 times the rated value. The rated value is 60, so that'd be 0.9 times 60. If we're under really warm conditions, we actually increase our, our voltage breakdown limit. And a similar plot is shown for the channel resistance as a function of junction temperature. So you can see that as our part heats up, our channel resistance will increase. And it's again given as a normalized value. So you have to multiply this times the rated value of the, of the part. And beyond this, uh, the data sheet will specify the circuits that are used to characterize each of these graphs. So this is an overview of what a data sheet for an actual part looks like. I'm going to post this on the class website. And um, we'll be using some of these values to actually calculate the performance characteristics of the device in our next video series, which will focus on the, the conduction losses and the switching losses of these devices.